Section 2 of America's Political Heritage discusses the roots of American government that came from Europe. The first section we talked about the ideas that came from the colonies. Now we're going to look at what our founding fathers found in the history books from Europe. First we look at Athens, Greece. Athens, Greece, ancient Athens, Greece, used what we call a democracy. A democracy is a form of government where the people are directly involved with the government and the decisions that have to be made. The people do not elect representatives. The people vote and then what the majority votes is put into action. A classic example of this today would be a town hall meeting where the people would get together and they would directly voice what they want. Another example would be a school board meeting where the people could attend and they could directly voice their opinions and what they want. And even jury duty, where a group of people would vote and whatever they vote, majority or unanimously, would be put into effect pertaining to that trial. The people cannot feasibly go to the United States Congress in Washington, D.C. To, to voice their opinions. We, we can't realistically go to our, our state capitals and voice our opinions directly. This is usually done on a smaller scale. Most people think that the United States is a democracy when, they, when they're asked what type of government that we have, but in reality this isn't true. We are more of a republic. A republic is a form of government where the people choose representatives to make the big decisions in government. So when we talk about our state senate and our state assembly house, that's our state congress located in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We elect representatives to make our government policies because there's too many people to directly vote and make those decisions for the state of Pennsylvania. So we elect representatives and each of the different districts that we reside in have their own representatives. For example, I live um, north of Hazleton and my Pennsylvania House Assembly member is Phyllis Mundy and my Pennsylvania Senator is Lisa Baker. This also applies to our federal government. The people of Pennsylvania and the people in each of the other 49 states elect representatives who go to Washington DC and they work in the Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives to make the laws for the country and the people that we elect from Pennsylvania we hope that they're going to vote for policies and laws that benefit the people in Pennsylvania. Um, for example, our two U.S. Senators that the people of Pennsylvania have elected are Bob Casey and Patrick Toomey. Bob Casey was elected in 2006 and Patrick Toomey was elected in 2010. And our Congress, Pennsylvania is divided into different districts, and I live in the 10th district, and my U.S. Congress member is Tom Marino. But all of those, those gentlemen put together are the representatives that the people have elected to make the policies in our national government. This is a republic. So in reality, we are a democracy on a smaller scale, and we are a republic. So our, our country is a democratic republic. And these ideas came from ancient Athens and ancient Rome, which is located in Italy. We also took ideas from the history of Great Britain. The main idea to limit the power of the government came from limiting the king's power. In 1215, a group of nobles, who would basically be the elite in England, the rich, um, used their forces to persuade the king of England at that point in time to sign a document called the Magna Carta. And the Magna Carta put restrictions on the king and what he could do and what he could uh, sign into law for the people. Basically, at this point in time, his power is limited because he can't just make any law that he wants. He needs now to get the approval of the nobles 
and only after they have voted yes on a law that he would like or on taxes or any other change would that law be put into effect. Gradually, this group of nobles who now must approve all of the king's actions becomes British Parliament. And that's another form of a legislature. And the parliament members are eventually chosen by the people. This, this parliament, this legislature, over time, by 1689, has gained so much power in government that the monarch is, is gradually becoming just a symbol. He's, he's not, he does not have as much power as he had in the past. And the British Parliament, now here's an example of nobles versus other subjects. The nobles had the money and the land. The Parliament was able to have the king sign the English Bill of Rights. And a bill is a document, it's a, a proposal, it's a list, and the rights are the rights of the people. And instead of just rights being extended to the nobles, as they had been under the Magna Carta of 1215, now these rights are extended to all people, rich and poor. And some of these rights included the right to petition the government, which means you have the right to ask the government for change without being afraid of being locked up or, or punished. It also gave people the right to freedom of speech and the right to trials by jury. In the past, if you were arrested in England, you sometimes were not told why you were arrested, your family was not notified, and you may have been locked in a cell and not given the chance to defend yourself, not given the chance to bring evidence to prove your innocence, and you might find yourself there for the rest of your life without any, any logical reasoning. This is probably one of the most important documents that influences our country because we take many of the rights that these people are given and we, we transition them over to our government and give them to our own people. Finally, we take a look at two philosophers for the ideas that we use in our government. One of the main, main things that our country is built on is the idea that we all have natural rights and this was developed by John Locke. He was a philosopher from England. And a philosopher basically questions everything. And John Locke was questioning the, the purpose of government. In, in his mind, the people did not exist for the government. The government exists for the people. And if any government, at any point in time, uses tyranny over the people and takes away their natural rights of life, liberty, and property, then the people have a right to dissolve that government and create one that works for the people. Now these ideas are taken quite literally by Thomas Jefferson and he uses these words in the Declaration of Independence when he says that the English government was taking away our life, our liberty, and our pursuit of happiness. And because it did that, that gives us the right to, to dissolve the English government and create our own, which is what we eventually do. The final idea that we use in our government today came from a man called Baron de Montesquieu. He was from France. He was another philosopher. And he originated the idea of separation of powers. Separation of powers, simply put, is instead of giving all power to one man, for example, the English monarch, it should be divided into three sections. And this is exactly what our government is today. He said that there should be a legislative branch which makes the laws an executive branch in charge of enforcing those laws and a judicial branch in charge of interpreting laws. Now today these three branches have many more powers and duties that go very far in depth which we'll deal with in, in the next chapter or so, but basically no one branch can perform any action without, without the other two. And this is important because when you put power in one person's hands they can literally do what, whatever they choose. In this case, you always have other branches watching each other so that they can stop anyone from committing acts of tyranny. This concludes the Section 2 presentation. You can move on to the activities and the Check for Understanding quiz.